Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 462nd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Summer is upon us here in Phoenix, and it's hot. With more people getting skin cancer these days, I'm not willing to take chances with the sun anymore. Before I introduce today's podcast guest, I want to share with you how I stay cool and comfortable working in the summer heat. My number one strategy is wearing lightweight, breezy, sun-protective clothing, like cool, moisture-wicking shirts and hats that shade my head, ears, and the back of my neck. I've partnered with Gemplers.com to handpick my personal favorite sun-protective wear, and you can see them at Gemplers.com forward slash urban farm. That's Gemplers, G-E-M-P-L-E-R-S.com slash urban farm. When you use the code urban farm zero one, you get 20% off your first order. Heidi and I use these essential items on this list every day on the urban farm. Check them out and stay cool this summer. Superfoods like blueberries, sweet potatoes, turmeric, ginger, garlic, microgreens, and more are so full of nutrients, they are considered to be exceptionally healthy. Growing them is easy if you know what you're doing. And that's why I'm sharing with you the Superfood Garden Summit. In this free online event, you'll glean the secrets of visionary gardening experts and learn their best hacks. Plus, I will be presenting a talk on three keys to ultimate fruit tree success. Between presentations, get your questions answered with live Q&As and even win prizes. Did I already mention that this is happening online and it's free? So you can attend from anywhere. Learn more and reserve your spot at urbanfarm.org forward slash superfood. Today on our podcast, we have someone who turns garden pests into edible treats. We're talking with Molly Watson about harvesting garden snails. Molly is the editor-in-chief of Edible Communities, the flagship website for a network of 80-plus hyper-local food magazines across the U.S. and Canada. She is the author of Bowls and Greens and Grains, both from Chronicle Books, as well as the forthcoming Should We All Be Vegan? out in fall of 2019. She lives in San Francisco, where the winters feel cooler than her native Minnesota, no matter what the locals say. Molly hates to garden. She's tried it. She really wants to like it, but she doesn't. She wrote a bit about it in her award-winning piece, Cooking's Not For Everyone, about how people shouldn't have to cook or garden to have high-quality, locally-grown, sustainable foods. Welcome to the show today, Molly. Are you ready to rock bugs? I sure am. Excellent. (laughs) So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Oh, such a long and winding path and so many blanks to fill in. I think, you know, if we're talking about snails and the fact that, you know, I was had the idea to even try to do that, maybe going back to the fact that I started off my professional life as a French historian. Wow. And then, you know, yeah, <laughs> super, you know, in case, just in case of a French history emergency, I'm always available. There you and, go. And, you know, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it just it didn't, being academic wasn't, wasn't exactly the right fit for me, but I loved writing and I loved food. So I was just like, oh, I'll be a food writer and then kind of jumped in. And it's all been, you know, kind of going from one project to the next since then. I spent a couple years looking at Sunset Magazine, which your listeners may or may not be familiar with. Oh, yes. That's when I really tried to love gardening, Greg, (laughs) because I was surrounded by a lot of people who could help me. And the gardens at the campus were so amazing and beautiful and inspiring. And, you know, my my boss, Margaret True, the food editor, had this whole idea of doing a one-block diet where we're going to grow all of our food and keep the chickens and eat the eggs. And in the end, I was I did the recipes for that project. Well, we need you. Which was great. Yeah, exactly, right? If you're going to grow all this good food, you do need someone to then come up with ways to eat it. So that's my role, and I accept it. Excellent. I was looking around Edible Communities website the other day and I saw an article that was written by you on eating snails. And, you know, we've had a couple of guests on the show around bugs and eating bugs. And, you know, my first thought was eating snails will ooh, but then I've actually eaten escargot before and it was actually pretty good. So how edible are they really? They're, I mean, if you've had escargot, you know exactly how edible they are. Uh That's, That's what they are. It's the same kind of snail. The snails in my garden here are the same snails that they 
grow in France specifically to eat as escargot. So once I found that out, the, the whole reason I did this, <laughs> I should backtrack a little bit, was that we, on a family trip to Paris, we were visiting friends from when I used to be a French historian. And my son was nine at the time and was really intrigued by this idea of eating snails. He got really into the whole food thing and really wanted to try escargot. And we went to some cafe and they were out. And then my French friend found out that, you know, my American son wanted to eat escargot and really took it upon himself to make that happen and bought, like, went to this, you know, very famous trateau and bought the escargot for us to make at home. And they were a big hit. And, you know, my son was like, oh, can we, we should eat the snails in our garden because he loved to help me pick the snails off the plants and try to save it. And at first I, I thought, well, no, those aren't the right snails, but I did some research, research and found out they were. And that's what led to the whole project was sort of trying to uh, encourage a love of food in my son and his interest in, in eating, you know, not, not just mac and cheese. Right. And obviously he converted you. Yeah, on that one, he converted me. I mean, he always liked escargot fine. I mean, it's just, it's a little nugget of protein in garlic butter. Like, I didn't really even appreciate the degree to which they had or didn't have their own flavor or anything, right? I mean, it's for anyone who's eaten escargot. It's really all about the garlic butter. Exactly. that. In fact, thinking about my times, and it's been, oh gosh, 30 years since I ate it, the restaurant I ate it at, you're right. It was a lot of garlic butter. Yeah. So when we harvested the snails, you know, we went out, we harvested them, and I had done, you know, some research on how do you then take them from your garden and and make them edible. It's quite a process, I have to say. If you read the article, you know. So you need to, to purge them, basically, of, you know, all the dirt and, like, random stuff they're eating while they're out while they're out in a garden. So I, we gathered them up. We put them in like a giant, you know, like a five gallon painter bucket, you know, giant white bucket yep. and gave them some herbs that we had in the fridge and from the garden. And I uh, had some fennel uh, and I had just heard any kind of vegetable at work. So we had some fennel kicking around, put that in there, covered the bucket with old pair of tights to keep them in there. And, but so that air could get through mm-hmm. and then uh, proceed, decide to keep it sort of in this, study or where I work that seemed out of the way and put my son to bed, (laughs) came downstairs, sat in my study to read and I could hear them crunching on the fennel. (laughs) Like they're, it's not, they're not as quiet as you would think. Wow. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Right. I mean, you could really hear them crunching away. So we fed them vegetables for a couple days and then you actually purge them with like cornmeal or oatmeal the reason, or you can do this with, according to Gordon Ramsay, you can also do it with carrots. And what you're doing is you're actually giving yourself a, a visual cue from their excrement that they've actually purged everything through. Got it. Um, so by giving them oatmeal or carrot, either are going to get a white or an orange product mm-hmm. <laughs> to clean up. And then once that's done, some people don't do this because they think it's cruel. Other people do. I did just trying to maximize the flavor, which was then you just don't feed them anything for a day. And you wait till they, you know, are sort of fully purged through. And then you boil them, take them out of the shells, boil them again in an acid water, because when you take them out of the shells that first time, they are, I think the whole experience from harvesting through this stage can be mainly defined as slimy. There's just a lot of slime yes. <laughs> involved in this whole process. Yeah. So like the bucket that I was keeping them in every day, I had to take them out and clean that bucket because it was just covered in slime and other things. Um, but slime was really the worst part of it, I have to say. Well, and it's really sticky slime, right? It's very sticky. Yeah, it is. Slime is almost a nice word for that substance. It's very mucusy. Yeah. Yeah, because also think, because, well, I know you mentioned the eating bugs, but snails are actually mollusks, so they're oh. related to other, yeah, yeah, which is weird. <laughs> well, and it makes sense, actually, when you think about it. It does make sense when you think about it. It also makes me feel a little bit better about a mistake I made talking about eating snails. I was a exchange student in high school. And I lived with a family in Dijon, which is in Burgundy, a famous wine-growing region. And uh-huh. it's also where escargot are from. It's a traditional dish there because the snails were harvested from the vineyards. And I was sitting with the family, and we were talking about different regional dishes. And I said that I thought it was so strange that snails were a regional dish there. 
And they were like, well, why? And I was like, well, because we're so far from the sea. And they, they were so oh. confused, and it came out that I thought that escargot were made from sea snails, but they are made from land snails. But they thought it was a very stupid American. Fair enough. But yeah, so you cook them, take them out of their shells, boil them in an acid water to kind of get that last bit of mucus and slime off of them. And then you can either put them, for traditional escargot, you put them back in the shell with a bunch of garlic butter and just cook it till the garlic butter Mm -hmm. melts, essentially, because the snail is already cooked. I experimented with a few other things, including the sort of most successful one was when I realized that the snail actually has a very earthy flavor, if you taste it just on its own. It's not a really strong earthy flavor, but that's the most pronounced flavor it has. So I sort of treated them almost like mushrooms and sauteed them with some garlic and put them on a salad with, with like arugula. And that was actually also very, very tasty. When end times come, I'm ready. Yeah, snail. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, we're talking about snails here. Those are these things in shells. We just have teeny little snails here in Phoenix. What we do have a lot of is slugs. Without, so it's the. I guess it's the snail without the shell. Are they also Pretty edible? Much. I'm gonna guess that you could do the same thing with them. I have not done that. Mm-hmm. I bet you could, though. I don't know why you couldn't. Yeah. I don't know what they'd taste like. It's the same. Well, if I'm sure... How, if you... big, how big are the slugs you have there? Because here we get those really big banana. You know, we get some big slugs here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they'll be three inches long. Yeah. So, yeah you know, yeah. the size of a small carrot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, it all comes... Again, I think if you I think if you were very desperate, definitely. Right. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, exactly. with enough garlic and butter, you can fix anything. <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty that, much. That is the case. So is there a trick to collecting them? I mean, you can... If, if you have snails in your garden, you probably know exactly where they are. So it's pretty easy. It's easier, obviously, to do at night because that's when they come out to eat. So they're kind of easier to find. If you're really serious about making it easier on yourself, you can set up like a board on two bricks over some, so, so it's kind of over some soil where maybe you know some snails oh, are yes, uh-huh. and like to hang out. And then just in the more, like first thing in the morning, if you go out and flip it over, you're going to, it's probably going to be covered in snails. You can just plop them off. Wow. Sounds, yeah. sounds that, start, that part sounds pretty simple. And then it gets complicated. The harvesting part is incredibly simple. As anyone who has snails in the garden can imagine because you see them. So, you know, you just pick them. One thing is, yes, in some areas, the, the snails are going to be kind of too small to bother eating, you know, mm-hmm. really. If you're t- those teeny tiny ones, because we get those here too. I mean, they're just smaller versions, but in some climates, they just don't get bigger. Right. Another issue we have in California is the soil doesn't have a ton of calcium in it. So the shells tend to be um, quite fragile. Right. So in terms of cooking them and taking them out and getting them back in the shell, that can be a little trickier than, you know, if you're buying them specific ones that have been raised to eat because they give them a lot of calcium and stuff so those shells get really hard Mm -hmm. yeah that makes perfect sense so is there anything a snail harvester should be wary of i honestly it's really the slime it's really the slime Uh (laughs) so my my big takeaway advice to someone who wants to do this is first of all after you've collected them having a place that's inside where you're going to purge them because I think you know, you imagine, oh, I have this bucket of snails that's getting all gross. I'm just going to keep it outside. If you live anywhere with like with raccoons or other pests that like raccoons love to eat snails. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah. So they'll, you don't want to keep them outside because you're basically just creating, you know, a, a buffet for, for some raccoons. They're going to steal all your snails. The other thing is be prepared. It's going to be, it's going to be slimy and dirty. That purging process is really... It's intense, and you might think, oh, I don't really need to clean it every day, but it actually gets more than twice as bad <laughs> if you want to go more than one <laughs> right. day. Really, I would highly recommend as horrible as this is keep it, cleaning, it, cleaning it every day and then, you know, giving them enough so they're, they're eating and uh, keep it just like a little bit damp but not wet, and that's kind of it. Yeah, perfect. And- yeah, it's a, it's, it's a remarkably easy, if it's involved, but very easy, if that makes sense. And given that you're the, the expert at recipes, any recommendations? It really, I mean, honestly, the best thing to do with them is escargot. And you don't need to get them back in the shell either. I mean, that's traditionally how they're eaten. Yeah. But you can just put the snails in like a dish with garlic butter, melt the garlic butter, you know, put it under the broiler, melt mm-hmm. the butter, serve it up with a bunch of baguette. I mean, that was by far our favorite preparation that we did. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> So I want to return back to your bio a little bit. 
edible communities. I know we've had Edible Phoenix here for 12, 13 years. I actually mm-hmm. I actually was one of the writers for Edible Phoenix for seven years. And oh, cool. Yeah. Tell me about Edible Communities because it's, it is a really, really cool project. It is super cool. Edible Communities. So the different, so like Edible Phoenix, which you have, is an independently owned, locally, independently locally owned and run magazine that covers the local food scene in Phoenix. And there are 80, over 80 of these magazines that are part of a, a licensing network. So, you know, we have Edible San Francisco, Edible East Bay, Edible Manhattan, Edible Boston, Edible Sarasota. They're, they're all over. Um, and because they're all locally owned and run, they're all pre, even though they're all covering local food, they're all do that in their own way, in a way that makes sense for their community. Mm-hmm. So it's, I'm lucky enough to get copies of all the magazines, oh, <laughs> which nice. is a little overwhelming, but it's also just super cool to see just how different places, because, you know, in some places it's really much more about kind of the restaurant scene and what are the chefs doing with the local foods that are available. And some are much more sort of about policy and programs going on locally to get food to more people. You know, it's just, it's really great. Some are more recipe driven, some are more story driven. Some have a lot of gardening, some don't, you know. So that's a pretty cool thing. And then as ediblecommunities.com, which is sort of a central, you know, we, we like to feature the best from all the magazines. And then we also do content that, you know, would be of interest to sort of people around the country mm-hmm. uh, who are interested in local sustainable foods and a better food system. And, you know, just things like seasonality guides and great recipes for when you come back from the farmer's market and you're like, wait, what am I going to do with all these radishes? You know, that's what we're, that's what we're kind of there for. Yeah. Or wait, what am I going to do with all these snails? Yeah. And so here's, here's the, re- the, the reason we put the snail piece up, because I, I actually wrote that piece a couple years ago uh-huh. for Edible San Francisco. I did a series of hunting and forage. Uh, I did a year long series where each quarterly issue I hunted or foraged for a different food uh, for the first time. So I did mushroom hunting. I did the snails. I went crabbing for the first time, and I foraged plums off a neighbor's tree, my cousin's tree, actually. And, you know, sort of, so each thing was sort of about the process of getting that food, and then what do you do? Because when you go about doing that, you often end up with a lot of that thing. So oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you do with it? That was pretty fun, but we ran it because we actually, uh, I got, I get a lot of press releases about a lot of stuff. And I got one about National Escargot Day. And usually, like, National Hot Dog Day, National... I usually ignore those things. Right. It's not something that really interests me or our readers particularly. Or National um, or but, National Donut Day. Yes, exactly. Oh, Which, I, you know, I'm happy to celebrate personally, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, I celebrate, you know, in a private way, Greg. Yeah. Um, but National Escort Code, the fact that that existed struck me as so funny. I was like, oh, we should put that piece up. <laughs> so that, that's sort of how that came about because I was like, that actually is the idea that you can eat the snails in your garden. You know, if you're not spraying your garden with a bunch of, of uh, poison, you can, eat, you can eat your snails. I love edible communities and what you guys have done with oh, it. Oh, thanks. It's such a great entry point for people who just want to know more about what, what does that even mean? eat local food, you know, and then as you get more interested and more involved, there's always new things to do. There's always that next step, you know, from I'm just going to cook with these seasonal vegetables I got at the grocery store to I'm going to go to the farmer's market to I'm going to plant an edible garden to I'm going to rip all this up and make it permaculture. (laughs) There's just always like kind of a next step and thing for people who are really interested in being more connected to their food to do. Yeah. Well, awesome. We have this paragraph in your bio. It says, Molly hates to garden. I know. She's tried it, and she really (laughs) wants to like it, but she just doesn't. I wish I loved it. It's so frustrating. It really is this thing where I, it fits, because I love so many things that kind of go in that world of gardening. I love to cook. I love fresh vegetables. I love, like, to do all this sort of handicraft stuff. I love knitting, and stuff. I love all that stuff. So it just seems like I should love gardening. And so I've tried it so many times. And, you know, we have a yard that I need to do stuff with, but I've really tried. I just don't stick with it in a way that tells me I don't 
like it enough, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my mom is a great gardener. She has an amazing green thumb. She's one of those people where people bring her their dying plants and they come back to life. And, you know, she's she one of these. Them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, can grow anything and has always had these just beautiful, beautiful gardens all growing up. Now, the fact that I was forced to weed these, perhaps that might play into my lack of, of, of love of gardening now. I don't yeah. know. I really, yeah, I wish I loved it. I don't, but it's been, I think that that, it made me much more sympathetic to people who don't like cooking, is what it did. When I finally realized I just mm-hmm. don't like this, despite the fact that I should and I want to, it made me more sympathetic to the idea that, you know, for, it's very easy for me to tell people, oh, it's really easy to make a homemade dinner every night, or of course you can do this, or this is easy. It is easy for me, and part of the reason it's easy is I like doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, that, that makes things easier, and because I like doing it, I do it all the time. And it is true, the more you cook, the easier it is to cook, the faster you are, you know, the less intimidating it is, the more ideas you have, the sort of more in it you are, the more more in it you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. The more you're thinking about it, the more you care about it, it just gets easier and easier. And I see that with my friends who've taken up gardening. That's also very true. Mm -hmm. But so the fact that I don't like it has actually really changed my attitude about if we want a better food system, like what the solutions are to that. You know, and the solution can't be that everybody has to cook all their own food. It's just not realistic. You know, it, it's as if the solution to a better food system is everyone has to grow their own food. Yeah. You know, and it's right. like, well, that's probably not going to work. <laughs> you know, I like to point out to people who get, because obviously a lot of food people get pretty bristly if I say that, because they actually do think like cooking is the key. And I don't argue that, I mean, obviously, when people cook their own food, they tend to eat healthier. You know, it, it is a great thing. It's mm-hmm. just, I don't think that that can be our only solution. And I'll point out, like, well, when we have, when we find out that, like, there's child labor or slavery being used to make tennis shoes, our solution isn't, oh, well, we should just all make our own shoes. <laughs> you know, it's like the solution can be better laws, better regulations, better oversight of an mm-hmm. industry. And I, right. I, I feel that, sa- I feel that same way about, you know, the food system. It's like, well, we need better regulation. We need a better system, but it can't, we can't put that individuals Beautiful. completely. Yeah, exactly. So you've got a new book coming out. In fact, I want to invite you back when the book comes out. It's called, Should We All Be Vegan? And that is a question, it is. not a statement. It is a question. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the book. Vegan, the vegan is part, or the the book is part of a series from Thames and Hudson, which is a publisher in the UK. And the series is called it's the Big Idea series. So it's a series of very short, to the point things that cover sort of big questions that give people sort of very the basic information about them. Some of the other ones, you know, there's one about gender, there's one about democracy, there's one about medicine, these sort of big cultural questions. So they approached me about writing one, should we all be vegan? And I just thought, like, I want to make sure I'm the one that writes that (laughs) so that I can figure out the answer to it, (laughs) basically. So it's pretty cool to look at some of the issues around, because I think when we start talking about what we should be eating we go kind of two big places, right? There's, if you're interested in sustainability, you go immediately to all the environmental concerns around meat and animal husbandry. And then the other tact is sort of a more personal one, right? And it's like individual health. Yes. It was really interesting to research also the history of vegetarianism and how you get a rise from, it kind of goes from like Pythagoras being vegetarian and insisting his students are vegetarian and in fact, until the word vegetarian gets invented in the 19th century, people who didn't eat meat were called themselves Pythagoreans or on a Pythagorean diet. Like that's what it was known as oh, um, in Europe. Yeah, which I didn't, you know, I learned all kinds of stuff. And that really until you get until the late Enlightenment and early Romantics, until then, vegetarian was really always sort of more of an ethical moral thing. It was, it was really about the ethics of it and whether it was right to kill an animal or not to use animals that way. And you get in the late 18th, early 19th century, a real switch to, you still have that. A lot of people, that's their tech. But you get a new concern that's really more about personal health and how you feel when you eat different foods. It was pretty interesting. And then you really don't get veganism as a separate category until the 1940s, which was interesting. And it was 
brought up basically to differentiate people who just didn't eat meat versus people who didn't eat any kind of animal. So it was, it was, it was really interesting looking at, you know, environmental concerns, looking at personal health concerns. And of course, now it's not just the health aspect, it's a sort of aesthetic and sense of yourself um, mm-hmm. aspects and that, that kind of overlapping. But yeah, the public health issues are, are pretty big too. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, you know, I, I, cool. I have Lyme disease and, Mm. Uh, I was diagnosed about five years ago with it. And one of the things that significantly impacts my health and well-being is what I eat. Sure. And it's this, it's this ongoing exploration of can I eat that and still feel good? And a lot of the – I think for me a lot of the meat products, which I primarily avoid, have other stuff in them because they're kind of – they're at the top of the food chain. They sure are. <laughs> and they're, you know, they basically bioaccumulate all the stuff of, you know, all of the food that they're eating. So what I finally got to in the past couple of years is that it's really just a process of, all right, what do I put in and how does it make me feel? And really being conscious about that. Yeah. And I think the thing that's really important to keep in mind, because, you know, as I was saying, you sort of have the, the sort of bigger environmental sustainable issues, and then you have the sort of personal health issues that are also public health issues. But what sort of intrigued me also was, well, what does it mean for a culture to not eat meat? Like, what does it mean to give up traditional food? You know, what, mm-hmm. what, what kind of impact do the sort of more, you know, what are the social impacts, first of all? And if, if, if you've experimented a lot with what you do and don't eat, you also understand that can really affect how you do and don't socialize with different people. Oh, yeah. You know, it has, a, it has an impact for sure. And then there's sort of that aspect. And then there's also the cultural aspect, you know. What does it, you know, why is it people get so freaked out if you suggest a Thanksgiving without a turkey? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right? When yep. it's like, well, the holiday isn't actually about the turkey. So things like that. And then looking at cultures where, you know, it's very meat-heavy, Inuit cultures, the Maasai, there's cultures where like they pretty much only eat animals. So what would it mean if they didn't eat any animal, you know? And is that even realistic? Is that, you know, can people live in certain places without eating animals or animal products? You know, taking that kind of really bigger picture view of all of humanity instead of, I think a lot of times when we talk about these issues, we assume, you know, a sort of industrialized America situation, you know? Yep. So, yeah, but I think the other thing, I mean, what, what you're talking about that I think is a really important thing for people to keep in mind is humans vary a lot and our reactions to foods vary a lot and how we feel, you know, it's a pretty, it's remarkably as much as we're biologically the same, these foods seem to affect us very differently, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind before you start making, you know, blanket decisions and proclamations. Exactly. You know, and that's, that's what I finally got to a few years ago. It's, it's, we, each individual has to figure out what works for them. Absolutely. And what works for you is, is probably a combination of, you know, what makes you feel better, what makes you feel good in your skin, what gives you energy. Mm-hmm. But then also, like, what's sustainable, what you like, <laughs> what you don't like, you right. know? As someone who, you know, has had a career kind of based around loving food, you know, and, and you know, loving healthy food and how I, you know, and, but a mix. I am all, I am the queen of moderation. I am definitely in the Julia child, like even moderation should be observed in moderation camp, you know, that to me, like eating, it's a chance to have some pleasure every day, you know, and enjoy it and whatever, however, whatever that means for people. So also in coming up with, with something that works for someone long-term, it also has to include, you know, things they like and a diet that they can actually live with long-term too. Amen. So to many that. factors. Yes, absolutely. So many factors. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. Oh, my. Well, I'm going to talk about what I saw. It's really, there's so much, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to life. If you're, if you're, I'm a human, exactly, right? Yeah. Like, so much of life, if you're paying attention, is about learning from all those little failures, right? Yep. Like people tend to look to these big things. And to me, it's like those little ones that are really the transformative things for me anyway. And I will say there's this one moment that really stands out for me where I get really shifted how I thought about stuff. And it was, I, it was a real failure of imagination on my part. I was traveling with my extended family and we were wandering around a small city. We hadn't really made plans on where to eat. And all of a sudden we're sort of all hungry and needed dinner. 
And as the food person, you know, I sort of definitely was taking the lead and sort of deciding. And I'm also, I have my, my um, superpower is a really excellent sense of direction. Oh, uh, nice. And like remembering where things were. So I was also leading people back to things that I thought I had seen and that kind of thing, right? The problem is I was also very hungry, which is not when I'm the most decisive. <laughs> so I was sort of having trouble deciding and like really nixing a lot of things that probably would have been, you know, I was like dismissing this place and that place and making people walk more, even though we're all hungry. And we finally found a place that, you know, met my standards, whatever those were. And it all ended up being fine. We had this like really lovely meal, you know, all that. And we're walking back to the hotel and I was kind of walking with my dad and he, he just wondered aloud to me, he was, you know, I, and I would kind of apologize for, you know, having kind of dragged everyone through that whole ordeal and he was like, yeah, you know, I just, honey, I, I don't understand, like, why are you so afraid of a bad meal? <laughs> and it really just, like, transformed, because I was so, it was maybe, at, like, I was really in it. I had the, I had really kind of, you know, set myself up as a food writer. I had, it was at a time where I was working at Sunset, so I'd really sort of made it, and I was really in this camp of, you know, food is everything to me and all that. And I just realized that I had sort of tortured all these people for no, you know, that the, the point of the meal was for us to be together, not mm. to eat in exactly the right place. Right. Um, and it just really, that along with my sort of epiphany around how I didn't like gardening and that changed my idea of cooking, that like one comment from him, like really readjusted my outlook on like what was important about food and that it isn't, it isn't just the taste. It isn't just the food. It's that it's the event. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the entire event really is just about the food. And sometimes really the food is almost, really it is just fuel, and that can be okay. <laughs> wow. And what do you consider your biggest success? Honestly, in this day and age, the fact that I support myself as a writer and as a, an editor is actually probably the thing I take greatest pride in. Boy, do I get that. It takes, <laughs> it takes a lot to be able to do that. Congratulations. Thank you. And what drives you? This is going to sound really sad at first, but stick with me. I'm very driven by this quote from uh, Kierkegaard. Okay. And he says, yeah, the most, yeah, exactly. It's pretty depressing straight out of the gate. When he says, it's, uh, what is it? It's the most common form of despair is not being who you are. So I am very driven to be who I am and mm. to model what that can look like to other people. I'm established enough in my career. I have some young mentees and things like that. I have a kid. I'm very driven by that. Because that allows you to also change sort of like career-wise exactly what the focus is at any given minute. You know, I've had a lot of different kinds of jobs over the years. But if I look at it, that's the thing that, that really drives me at this point. Yeah. So that is actually, and I've not heard that before, but that is actually one of the big reasons I do this podcast and share with people the way that I do. Because I just, it makes me sad when people aren't in love with their life. Yeah. And, and it's not easy necessarily. <laughs> That's right. And, and it's a choice. Yes. You can choose differently. And I like to drive people to that funnel through looking at permaculture and gardening and growing your own food. So awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's cool. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? This is for a very particular listener out there. <laughs> it's not going to be for everyone. When I think about this, I think about, well, what books have really informed my thinking or, you know, been like really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And I really go back, it's, it's called Distinction by Pierre Bourdieu, who is a, was a French sociologist. And it's this study, the book he then wrote in the 70s. And it's all about social capital, cultural capital, economic capital, intellectual capital. It's about all these different sort of values. And he did this incredible sociological study of different class groups and different education groups in France and like the kinds of decisions they then made, including what to eat. And did a lot of graphs and plotted all this stuff out. And of course, the food stuff really hit me. I read this in college and it, it really hit me. I remember we, my roommates and I Xeroxed the food graph and put it up on our fridge to kind of like see what we were up to. Right. <laughs> Even though, of course, it wouldn't have applied to us then in America. But anyway, it was sort of interesting. And several years ago for Gastronomica, I actually redid the graph at the, that moment in time in America, like where would different things fall? And that was a super fun project. I enjoyed very much. But it's a, a kind of crazy book that makes you realize the choices we're making. Like you, you don't know all the factors going into all your choices and neither do other people. You know, so it's also to me, again, that reminder of the sort of individual choice and you being more aware of why you're making the choices you're making and also being 
maybe more understanding to why other people aren't making choices you think would be better for yeah. them, you know, yeah. that were motivated by things beyond pure rationality when we make choices. Wow. So yeah, that's, that's a book I think about a lot still. Cool. And the name of it again is? Distinction by Pierre Bourdieu. Yeah, I see it here on Amazon. Um, there you it, go. It, it, it's big. Yeah, and it, it the the social survey that he did sounded very much like what I've learned in permaculture. Oh, how so? Interesting. Yeah, at, at looking at the different the different cultural aspects because what people don't understand about permaculture is that it's not just about gardening. Permaculture looks at all natural systems and look at and right. looks, and looks at how they overlay on human beings essentially. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Besides avoiding the most common form of despair by being yourself, (laughs) um, (laughs) I would say, and this is the advice that I like to give, to me, it uh, it started off me giving this to people when I would, would teach them how to cook a dish or how to cook and has sort of morphed into something bigger, and that is, it's just a cake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. You know, like it, you're in the kitchen, you're making like just just try stuff. It's just a cake. It's just a garden in your case. Like try it, planting something. It's just a plant. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. To me, it's just like just try stuff. Just try it. Does it sound good? Give it a whirl. You know. Yeah. You just don't know what's going to come of it. You know, it's very interesting that you would say that. This morning, I tried a. I made up a recipe for gluten free pancakes, and I made them this morning. Uh huh. And they were disgusting. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just a pancake. It's just a pancake. I know, and it's hard to remember that because, I mean, on the other hand, I actually am sorry because, like, you had this idea, and then you cooked it, and you were looking forward to it, and then it's not good, and it is disappointing, right? Yeah. But it's also momentary, and you can try again. Yep. And that's why it's like it's, it's okay. It's kind of like my dad's thing. I'm like, I don't know why you're so afraid of a bad meal. It's like a moment of disappointment, and you get to try again. Yeah. You know? I'm sorry, we do have a good recipe for gluten-free pancakes on ediblecommunities.com, just so you know. Okay, I'm going there next. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's all about the flour mix, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, exactly. I do want to do one shout-out to you. You said something a little earlier that I absolutely love that you said it. You said your superpower is. and Yeah. It first of all, first of all, I I have that same superpower. You could drop me in New York City or Los Angeles or Madrid, Spain, and I could you know I could figure out where I was at pretty quickly. But I love that you called it out, and I just want to give you a virtual high five for that. Cool. I'm glad to hear you have the same one. So, do people often stop you to ask for directions because you look like you know where you're going? Yeah, that hasn't happened a lot, but. Okay. I also don't travel a lot, so... Right. My theory, I get asked for directions no matter how obviously not of that place I am, which uh-huh. I find interesting. And I think, I, I actually, my theory is it's a combination of I do look like I know where I'm going, and then I'm also a small woman, so very safe to, you know... Got it. People feel safe coming up to me now. I mean, <laughs> it happens a lot less now because people are on their phones with their maps. Yeah, here you go. Well, thank you so yeah. much for joining cool. us on the show today, Molly. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It has been a blast, and we definitely want to come back when your book is out. Cool. So how can our Happy listeners to. get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me through ediblecommunities.com. I'm Molly at ediblecommunities.com. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash snails. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Superfoods like blueberries, sweet potatoes, turmeric, ginger, garlic, microgreens, and more are so full of nutrients, they are considered to be exceptionally healthy. Growing them is easy if you know what you're doing, and that's why I'm sharing with you the Superfood Garden Summit. In this free online event, you'll glean the secrets of visionary gardening experts and learn their best hacks. Plus, I will be presenting a talk on three keys to ultimate fruit tree success. Between presentations, get your questions answered with live Q&As and even win prizes. Did I already mention that this is happening online and it's free? So you can attend from anywhere. Learn more and reserve your spot at urbanfarm.org forward slash superfood. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. 
Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.